this is a like a continuation of the 15 um, question study on the law and grace found it on amazing facts website so I added a little kind of like subtitle to the thought questions because what it is they are actually misconceptions regarding the law in the Bible they're not based on fact most of them they're based on popular misconceptions and misunderstandings regarding the law of God is found in the Bible what is a misconception we finished our lesson and it has an additional component to it it has a quiz and the current document we're working on here now is actually the thought questions if you go to amazing facts website you will find this when you bring up the lesson at the very end you will find these components and I went to the dictionary to Webster's online dictionary to the thesauruses and I was looking for the synonyms and anonyms of this word misconception and as you can see it has some interesting ones uh, some synonyms for misconception delusion error fallacy falsehood misbelief illusion I like the one old wives tale and then you have words related to it you have words like superstition distortion and accuracy misapprehension all of these misunderstanding and all of that and at the bottom here it lists one I thought was kind of interesting it says half truth lie story tell but the anonym for this word misconception is actually truth and verity something that's so solid it does not change verity is it when you look at that it's just tight everything is provable everything is solid so I think it's kind of interesting some of the misconceptions that we have about the law of God as recorded in the Bible and its obligations on mankind and many of these that people stumble over are actually misconceptions of the role of God's law in man, with man and his responsibility to obey that law misconception question 7 why do so many people deny the binding claims of God's law I really don't understand how can you claim to be a Christian and you don't live according to the law of God. I really don't understand how people view their concept of salvation. If you don't think God's law applies to you, how are you going to be saved? I really don't understand that view at all. I'm just being honest. The lesson says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Romans 8, 7, and 9. And this to me, the carnal mind, that is so true. Because be in or out. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I can never understand people who claim to be in the church and yet they they had a duplistic life and in my own life when I was learning to give up all the evil and stuff that that I had had inherited from three generations and in the cultivated evil I had cultivated and and grew in my own spirit I had to overcome all of that I had to read I had to pray I had to study and I had to come to understand it on what the Word of God said but one thing I learned in my early days when you trying to be in part the way and out part the way it make you crazy it make you crazy because you go to church on Sabbath and you know you are not in the right frame of mind or you know you got things going on that you need to quit and you ain't willing to give it up and this is I think why many people deny the binding claims of God's law is so that they can be saved on their own terms and that's what it is the people in the street ain't worried about God's law cuz I sure wasn't but when you come in the church and you worried about your salvation and you trying to be saved, and many people who don't want to give up the things of the flesh that they like, the easiest way to do that is to say that we can just get rid of God's law. He don't really mean that. And that's why I think many people do that because they got stuff going on in their lives, but they want to be a Christian, but they don't want to give up their little activities they got going on the side. So that thing about the carnal mind being enmity with God, that's the truth. But to, to why not just go on back out? That's my whole thing. 
Why not just go on back out in the world? Why are you going to sit up in the church and say, uh, I want to be a Christian, but God's law ain't, can't control me. I'm going to go to heaven on my terms. I don't really think that's going to work. And I don't know how <laughs> you claim to be a Christian and then you deny the very law that God says you have to obey. That to me is slapping God in the face. I'm just saying. Because if you claim to be a Christian, you claim to be Christ-like, then you must live the way Christ lived. He lived a holy, undefiled life. He never denied the law of God. So that, to me, is just a circular reasoning of some crazy thought. I just don't know how people come up with that. I'm just being real. How can you claim to be a Christian and the very law of God that Christ lived for us, and you deny that that's no longer binding on you? Oh, yeah, that's not going to work. God is not going to hear that in the judgment. Misconception question 8. Were the righteous people of the Old Testament saved by the law? No. We're just going to put that answer out there right now. No one has ever been saved by the law. And I'm going back to our lesson study. We now know that the law is only the mirror. It is only the mirror to show us the areas of our life that are not in harmony with God's law. So this is the purpose of the law, so that we can bring our character into control through the power of Christ by submitting to him daily. And the Holy Spirit indwelling in us will give us the strength and the power to overcome the wickedness and the evil that we do. So even in the olden times, everybody was saved by the blood of Christ. Even Abel had to offer a lamb. When, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, they offered a lamb. That's right there in Genesis. So there had to be the shedding of blood, else there's no remission of sin. Everybody had to look to the coming Savior. Everybody from Adam on down to the end of time must look to Christ to be saved. So what does the lesson say? I, I think it's pretty good. All who have been saved in all ages have been saved by grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. 2 Timothy 1 and 9. The law only points out sin. Christ alone can save. That's why the law, it, it leads to death without the intercession of Christ. There is no in-between place we can go. If we don't allow Christ to work in us, to transform us, and we cling to the law, even though we claim we keeping it and we doing all of this stuff and we working by our own works, that's not going to work in the judgment. Because without the blood of Christ applied to your life, don't care how good you think you are, you're going to be outside. So the lesson continues to say, Christ alone can say, Noah found grace, Genesis 6 and 8. Moses found grace, Exodus thirty three seventeen. The Israelites in the wilderness found grace, Jeremiah 31 and 2. And Abel and Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and many other Old Testament characters were saved by faith according to Hebrews 11. They were, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. And we, by looking back to it, the law is necessary because, like a mirror, it reveals the dirt in our lives. Help me, Holy Ghost. Without it, people are sinners, but they are not aware of it. However, the law has no saving power. It can only point out sin. Jesus and he alone can save a person from sin. This has always been true, even in Old Testament times, Acts 4 and 10. 12 and 2 Timothy 1 and 9. So as you can see from this, the roll call of faith, everyone was looking forward to the soon coming Messiah. They were obedient to the law based on the promises of the Messiah coming, that if they would submit themselves and be transformed and live out their little probation in obedience to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, they could enter the kingdom of heaven at the second coming. This is the final misconception. This is misconception question nine. There's only nine of them. I think they touched on the, the most popular ones. Why worry about the law? Isn't conscious a safe guide? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You need to go back and ask Eve that. <laughs> oh, that didn't work for her. 
She was leaning to her own Wilson when she was talking to that snake. That is one of the most, what can I say? That's absolutely no. There is no way your mind, unrenewed by the power of God, is going to do anything but fight against him. Because there's two entities striving for your attention. You got the Holy Spirit and you got your devil guide. This is the real deal. This is where the rubber meets the road. If your conscience is not totally consecrated to God, if you're not weighing your actions, every decision you make, by the law of God, by the promises of Christ to us, the things we must overcome and the things that the Master has warned us about, you're going to find yourself in a bad place. And that's what the devil is counting on. He will make you think you're so wise. And that's what happened in heaven when you do the studies and, and the things I have read about the fall. I have this book called Story of Redemption. And it talks about how the argument that Satan had against God was that he was so holy, his conscience would always be a safe God. Yeah, how did that work out for us? We paying for that right now. The Bible speaks of an evil conscience, a defiled conscience, a seared conscience, none of which is safe. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death, Proverbs fourteen twelve. God says, "He who trusts in his own heart is a fool." Proverbs, excuse, Proverbs twenty eight and six. This is the reality of the human mind. Without the constraining power of the living God, we are horrendous. We would do some of the most insane stuff that would shock us. Sometimes we do things we don't even remember how we got in that situation. I have experienced that leaning to my own understanding. It do not come out well. I'm still paying for dumb stuff I've done 10, 15 years ago. Leaning to my own understanding. But the mercies of God have kept me. I have bared my little consequences. And God has weighed that stuff and not let me be overcome. Because I was leaning to my own understanding. Yeah, that's that. You No. Your conscience is never a safe God. Absolutely never. I'm always, I'm afraid of that free will thing. I tell people free will is the most powerful and frightening thing that God has given us. It requires much consecration. Every decision you make must be weighed in the will of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is truly a misconception. Your conscience, I don't care how long you've been in the church or how faithful you've been. Your conscience will never lead you straight unless you constantly, you can't trust how good your relationship with God was yesterday. You got to weigh it every day. Every day of your life, you got to weigh every decision you're going to make. Every decision you think you're going to make, every thought in your head needs to be weighed. Is this an evil thought? If you're thinking evil of people and you projecting on them negative thoughts and things you can't prove, that's evil surmising. That'll make you hate people who ain't done nothing wrong to you because you got a misconception. Well, how come they didn't call me back? I called her and she didn't call me back. Well, it turns out when you thinking she should be calling you back, she in the hospital. And you all at home all mad because this person didn't call you back. See, that's an evil surmising. That's that stuff the devil whisper in your ear. These are things that I battle because I refuse to lose my crown over the petty evil in my life. There is never a point in time that I feel as I have arrived. I'm constantly at God's throne, constantly trying to stay in tune with the king, constantly seeking that wisdom that will keep me from losing my soul. Because I have an evil conscience. We all do. Without the indwelling power of Christ, every moment of the day, we have some. We can do some of the most foul stuff. So, this right here, I think, is a, is a good last question. Your conscience without God is evil. Never think you so holy. Never think you have arrived to the point that your thoughts will always lead you right. Now we've come to the end of this Bible study on the law. The last question states, question 15, do you believe it is essential for a Christian, and I underline that word, to obey the Ten Commandments? This is the final slide. What is your answer now after all that has been revealed, the validity of the law, the fast 
that it is the express image of the Son of God. That's him. When you look at the King of Glory, he is the express image of God's law. He is faithful, just, holy, pure, all these things. This is who our King is. It's the law in human flesh that we can be encouraged, that we too can live a godly, holy life, that we can return to our first estate. You do understand that you have fallen from a high and holy place. When our first parents ate that fruit, they lost everything. They were pure and holy. They were communing with God face to face and the heavenly angels. And they lived in an environment that was pure and holy. No death, no suffering, no nothing that hurt. And when they ate the fruit and defied the express will of God, the command of God, the law of God, and chose to believe a lie, they lost it all. We have fallen a long way, but Christ has come to make provision that we can return to our first estate, back to the tree of life, back to open communion with God. All the glorious things that our first parents lost, God has promised us that if we would obey his law implicitly, submit to his loving rule in our lives, we too can return to our first estate. This is what this is all about. Please consider where you stand. Because in the judgment, what you're going to be judged by is this law. So the devil definitely does not want you to believe in it. He wants you to deny it and all of that so that you will be lost. Let's just keep it real. Nobody's going to heaven in defiance of the law of God. That is the express character of the king of glory and his son. This is what me, we must decide. Do we obey and live or do we disobey and die? This is a powerful study for me. I hope you will have a good answer. There is a quiz that goes with this Bible study and some thought questions. Uh, they're not going to be posted on Facebook. I'm going to just add them to my YouTube channel in the uh, playlist. But I hope you will understand that to be Christ-like or a Christian, you must obey his law. This is a 15-question Bible study on the law and grace. The title of it is written in stone. It is found on amazingfacts.org's website. I was going to do this online with some other students through Zoom, but that did not work out. So what I have done is I have created segment videos of the 15 questions that you will be able to listen to. And I will also include them on a playlist on my YouTube channel which will include all the videos that go along with this Bible study. But if you would like a printed copy, please go to amazingfacts.org and you will find this study there. Put on the, um, put on, it's on their site. And if you click on their little search icon and type in written in stone, it will come up.